The pre-dawn lineups. The crush of media. You you're going to get a fair trial, the relentless coverage. From that first cold February day, it was clear Gian Gomeshi's trial would be extraordinary, but not as might have been expected for the searing scrutiny on a disgraced celebrity or even on the criminal charges against him. Instead, the most withering spotlight landed squarely on the women who took him to court and the credibility of their word. I think it was excruciating. I feel like I was made to feel really ashamed of my own self. It's been hard, it's consumed me, it's, uh, but I needed to do it. The three women in the Gomeshi trial spoke to us about their experience in court. Two appeared together, including Lucy de Couture, the only one among them who has gone public. That was before the judge's decision. The third opted to take part on her own today. They agreed to share a courtroom experience they say is raw, painful, humiliating, where their foggy recollections, shifting statements and surprise evidence rock their credibility. I found, honestly, the experience of being interrogated to be intensely shameful. A lot of what Lucy was saying rings very true. It's pretty hard to have somebody rip you apart like that. To just go on the stand and be attacked. It's a lose, lose for me. In Canada, the right of the accused to remain silent is fundamental. The onus was on the Crown to prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt. The defense strategy, led by Marie Hennin, was a classic one. Focus on the women's credibility, question it to the point their allegations are not to be believed. And as the hundreds of live tweets flying out of that courtroom revealed in real time, those allegations of choking, slapping, biting, and hitting were barely mentioned. Instead, the narrative was about what the women did not disclose from the start. To me, I was there to talk about the violence. And not the rest of it. No, I, didn't, I still don't see it as relevant. There were a couple of things that I had forgotten. It all kind of runs together. I can't remember what I told them in my initial statement. In court, I said, this is what I remembered at the time. And when he pulled it, which way did he pull it? Back. Back towards the back of the yeah. seat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He pulled it back. Okay. He pulled it back. He pulled it back. All right. Totally back. The first woman to testify told police Gomeshi assaulted her twice, the first time in late 2002 when he suddenly yanked her hair while they sat in his car. The second attack occurred weeks later at his home, when she says Gomeshi dragged her to the ground by the hair and punched her repeatedly on the side of the head. The defense took aim at her sketchy memory. She got the make of the car wrong, and she couldn't remember if she was wearing hair extensions at the time of the first alleged attack. And what's more had in charge, she lied to police. Then I didn't have any more dealings with him after that. The woman told detectives after the second alleged attack, she couldn't bear to watch or listen to Gomeshi on TV or on the radio. I tried to put it out of my head, but I've had to listen to him, you know, I don't listen to, to Q ever. To prove that wasn't true, Hennin pulled up two friendly and flirtatious emails the woman sent Gomeshi a year later, referencing a segment he was in. Attached to one of the emails, a photo of herself in a string bikini. In court, the woman testified she couldn't remember sending the emails, but said they were bait to get Gomeshi's attention so she could confront him about what she says he had done. If I had sent him an email just saying, hi, call me, I, I just assumed he would never call back. If I had sent him a picture of my puppy, I don't think he would have called me back. It was all along the lines of trying to get him to call me. In his decision, Justice William Horkins wrote, Defense counsel's questioning revealed inconsistencies and incongruous and deceptive conduct. It is clear that she deliberately breached her oath to tell the truth. Her value as a reliable witness is diminished accordingly. Decouter was the second witness, and her credibility was arguably the most damaged by the end of her testimony. Is there anything else that you haven't told us that you should know? No. I don't even know what that would be. Decouter told police Gomeshi choked and slapped her after they had dinner in Toronto in 2003, and that she only had passing contact with Gomeshi after the incident. But just before the trial, Decouter told police she remembered sending Gomeshi flowers after the attack. But in court, Hennin charged Decouter forgot to tell police a lot more. 
In a display that drew gasps in the courtroom, Henin revealed photos of Gomeshi and Dekuter cuddling in a park that same weekend, and a raunchy email Dekuter sent to Gomeshi the next day, ending with this phrase. The court also saw a six-page letter Dekuter sent Gomeshi that ended with this sentiment, I love your hands. Dekuter told the court she doesn't remember that email or writing that letter. Why did you write that? All I can guess is that I was like, all right, okay, I can love that too. It's just never going to happen again. It's sort of like, I forgive you, sort of. Judge Horkins had especially strong words for her testimony. Ms. Dekuter's attempt to hide this information evidences a manipulative course of conduct. He went on to say, let me emphasize strongly, it is the suppression of evidence and the deceptions maintained under oath that drive my concerns with the reliability of this witness. It is difficult to have trust in a witness who engages in the selective withholding of relevant information. The final witness, identified in today's judgment as SD, would have another revelation. First, despite being instructed to not communicate with other witnesses in the trial, the woman and Decouter shared 5,000 Facebook and text messages. Some of the snippets read out in court took aim at Gomeshi. It was a plank for the defense to suggest collusion. If we were colluding to do something, say take his money or try and hurt him, I can understand. But all we wanted, really, if you, if you heard what, what we said back and forth, really what it comes down to is we just wanted him to feel a little bit of humiliation. That's it. That's it. But the court concluded otherwise. Ms. Decouter and SD considered themselves to be a team, and the goal was to bring down Mr. Gomeshi. And there was more testimony that the defense said proved she deliberately misled the court. I didn't scream, I didn't, I didn't yell, I, I don't know. I think, I feel like it was just sort of part of all of this. The woman told police she and Gomeshi were kissing on a park bench in 2003 when he suddenly bit her shoulder and put his hands around her neck, making it difficult for her to breathe. He called again because we went out again and it wouldn't have been me that reached out to him. The woman told police she agreed to see him again, but only in public. Maybe this stuff is not what I'm into and, and we, can, we can be friends. But just days before she testified, she told the court she caught the tail end of a news report about emails revealed at the trial and realized it was time to tell police the full story, that she had a sexual encounter with Gomeshi after the alleged assault a fact she omitted the first time she spoke to detectives. I wasn't asked the direct question if, so, if they had said, was there any other sexual you know, contact between you in any way, shape or form, something like that. Then I would have said yes, but it was easy for me to omit it. Did they ask you, did you see him again after the alleged assault? Yeah. And you said yes, because you had? Yep, I had. And at that point, why didn't you feel it was relevant to say that you had an intimate encounter with him as well? Because I don't see the relevance in that. Judge Horkins certainly saw it as pertinent. In assessing the credibility of a witness, the active suppression of the truth will be as damaging to their reliability as a direct lie under oath. He added, she ultimately acknowledged that she left out things because it didn't fit the pattern. Naive or self-serving, those omissions, lapses in memories or lies, all seem to physically deflate the crown. The question blaring in headlines, how could the prosecution not know the full story before trial? The answer begins in how police investigate sexual assault cases. Shocking to the courts, shocking to the Crown Attorney to, to have it come out at that particular time for sure. But really, in the, in the light of a different day, it's actually as normal as normal can be when you're dealing with sexual assault investigations. Dave Perry is a former detective with Toronto Police and now runs his own investigative agency. He's investigated thousands of sex crimes. Perry says police operate on the assumption that most people don't lie about being sexually assaulted. So the role of the police is to investigate the complaint, not the complainant. And we also have to understand that quite often victims of sexual trauma don't always disclose everything. Uh, sometimes in the initial interviews they don't, sometimes they actually never do. They just don't disclose everything. And Perry says there are only so many times police can ask if there's more to the story. I mean, in all three cases, 
police did ask them, and we saw this in the police statements, where the, the, the detective said, is there anything else? Is there anything else? And they say, nope. I've done so many of these cases, not, not just with women, of course, but with, with men who are victims of sexual trauma. And one of the last things I always say to them is, did you tell me everything? You know, I tell them, first of all, I believe you, but did you tell me everything? Some might argue it might be too soft an approach, that you've got to ask the hard, tough questions because they will come in a trial. Yep. What do you think of that? That's the balance, right? That's, that's that very tricky balancing act that you do as an investigator. But you know, for example, you don't typically investigate any complainant, let alone a, a complaint of a sexual nature. You don't start seizing people's hard drives and seizing and reading their emails and finding out if they communicated with anybody about this. It's just not what we do. Why not? Because it's not part of the process. I mean, you know, could you imagine if um, police services across this country suddenly, because of what came up in the Gomeshi trial, suddenly say, that's it, from now on, part of our protocol is every time we get an, a, a complaint of a sexual assault, we're going to automatically seize the victim's hard drives and we're going to go through their emails and we're going to do all of this. Nobody would ever come forward. Who would want their life under that kind of a microscope? After coming forward, after charges were laid, the women in the Gomeshi trial say they found themselves in a legal vacuum, despite having the assistance of counsel throughout the process. I didn't understand the process, so I really thought that there was going to be a conversation that we would have between me giving my initial statement, an interview where they would test the evidence, ask me tricky questions, mm -hmm. and draw stuff out. When I first went into this, I thought the Crown was my lawyer, <laughs> my defense lawyer, like a lot of people do. And when you meet with the Crown, one of the first things he'll say is, I'm not a defense lawyer. It's not their job. I expected a, a conversation at some point between giving my statement and, and going to court. I met with them twice before the court, before trial started. It was like the first time we ever talked about what happened was in court. But Judge Horkins called those arguments excuses. Navigating this sort of proceeding is really quite simple. Tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I don't think they dropped the ball in this case. Daniel Lerner is a former Ontario Crown prosecutor. He says the public needs to keep in mind the Crown acts on behalf of the public, not the alleged victims. The Crown represents the state. The Crown represents, in other words, the public. Uh, they're there to ensure that justice is done. They're there to ensure that there's a reasonable prospect of conviction and that there's a public interest in proceeding. In fact, any information given to the prosecutor must be disclosed to the defense because they are, at the end of the day, a witness. Lerner says the Crown prosecutes any case based on what those witnesses tell police and what that investigation reveals or doesn't. Basically, the Crown works with what it gets. It's not the Crown's role to come up with the evidence. It's not the Crown's role to investigate the case. Witnesses need to come into court very open and very honest about what happened. Uh, and if surprises happen, the, wit the Crown is stuck with the evidence they have and they have to do the best they can with the evidence they have. Convictions can be difficult in historical cases, especially, Lerner says, because it often comes down to he said, she said, and everything said in court is put to a grueling test. It's designed to prove a case beyond a reasonable doubt. Because once you say that they're saying things differently in court than what they told the police, or saying things in court different than what actually we can prove happened, well, now you have to start really questioning the credibility of the witness. The integrity of the court, as today's judgment underlined, is based on the presumption of innocence of the accused and the honesty and transparency on the part of anyone making an accusation. When I walked out of court, I left, I left a lot of that behind. I left a lot of it behind. My lasting impression is that I actually stuck with something that I was very difficult for me to do. I don't regret doing it. Um, it's been difficult. It's been hard. It's consumed me. It's, uh, but I needed to do it. I would do it again. I took one for the team. I wouldn't, I don't regret doing it at all. As for Decoutere, she's been inundated by strangers. Thousands have shared their stories of sexual violence with her. It's been a source of strength, she says, but it also leaves her feeling she doesn't measure up to all those expectations. How so? Um, because I just do feel so torn up because I do feel like I need to apologize for something, you know, and that's um, a lot to carry and I have to find a way to just shake it off and 
I'm not quite sure what that is. Somebody asked me uh, what would make me feel better, and there's nothing I can think of. In the end, the judgment made harshly clear there's no room for anything but the truth. And their version of it, the court determined, was too tainted by inconsistencies and outright deception to believe. Joanna Rumeliotis, CBC News, Toronto.